on this Sunday, fourth Sunday of Advent. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Christine, one of the church wardens here, and um, I bring greetings from Andy, who is over at St. Barnabas and St. John's doing carol services today, but uh, as I say, he sends his greetings. So let's light the fourth candle on the Advent ring, and I think the Baker family, where are you, Isaac, Rachel, coming up, thank you. And so this candle represents peace. So, so far we've had candles of hope, faith, joy, and peace. And sometimes it's known as the angel candle. Jesus came to bring peace and to bring people close to God and to each other. So let's um, just say an Advent prayer together. O oh God, you sent your Son into the world to be the Saviour of all who believe and promised that he will come again to be our judge. Increase in us the attitude of watchfulness, prayer and hope so that we may always be ready to meet him with our lamps trimmed and burning and our lives active in his service to the glory of your name. Amen. So let's join together in opening worship. Please remember to keep your face masks on if you're singing. Let's stand.
children go to their groups with their leaders, let's pray for them. Father, we lift the children and their leaders to you. Would this be a special time as they come together to learn more about you? And would they know how much you love each one of them? Amen. Off you go. And Carol and Derek, if you'd like to come forward for the readings, um, I've asked them to take the scenic route in view of uh, thank you. in view of all the scenery on the stage for later.
they come. Like waiting for the wise men. <laughs> The first reading is taken from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 to 5a. But you, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. This is the word of the Lord. Can Carol. Um, now Julian's going to come forward with today's message. Thanks, Julian. Good morning, everyone. Very good to see you all. Well done for making it out this morning. It's a busy weekend, isn't it, with stuff going on at St. Saviour's. So it's good to see you this morning. I've lost my little shelves. I usually put things on, so I'm thrown. So we come to the, the final Sunday in Advent. Haven't we? We've made it. Nearly there. And as we reach this, this weekend, I wonder, what, it is, what is it that you're longing for? What are you longing for? I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that we're all longing for a certain thing, getting rid of masks, restrictions, freedom, getting past all of this, this craziness and the, the, the fear and everything that we've been through the last two years. I'm sure we, whatever we think of that, we all want to be beyond it. But what else do we find ourselves longing for? You know, what, what, where do we find ourselves kind of groaning deep down? Maybe it's things in our families, broken relationships. Um, maybe it's people close to us who are suffering illness or a mental illness. So much of that around at the moment, isn't it? And it kind of makes us groan and think, Oh, we've got to get past this. 
stories we hear on the news, um, you know, just, just the refugees coming across on those boats and going down in the channel, doesn't that make you groan and think, oh, I just need a solution to that? Maybe we, we look around and our, our, just the society we're in, UK society, and it feels like we're on a road to self-destruction in so many ways as we've turned our backs on, on God and uh, are, are kind of heading in a, in a bad direction in so many ways. And I think, you know, in our most honest moments, we, we look at ourselves and we know that we're broken too. We're screwed up inside um, and despite the best face we put on it, we, we know that we're broken and we long to be not quite so messed up inside. Happy Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, it's going to get better. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying that. All, that's all to say, really, that we know, we know deep down that things are not the way they should be, don't we? whether it's in the world, in our relationships, in ourselves. And we, we long for a better world. We long for an amended world. We long, above all, for someone to come and put things right. And we're not the only ones with this longing for a better, different kind of world. The Hebrew prophets knew all about that longing, not least the prophet Micah, who we're uh, thinking about today. He... Micah lived a long time ago. 2,700 years, in fact, thereabouts. That's about more than 700 years before Jesus was born. And of course, his world, Michael's world, was very different in all kinds of ways. But as it says in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun, is there? Um, and the, the issues facing ancient Judah, uh, where Micah lived, I think sounds surprisingly contemporary. So Judah at that time was a pretty affluent place, Materially, the people were prospering. But as so often, the rich were getting richer at the expense of the poor. There was great inequality in their society. Corruption was rife. Even the religious leaders could be bought off. And God's ancient laws, which were designed to, to ensure justice and to, to protect the most vulnerable in, in society... Uh, his laws had been forgotten, abandoned. And though there might have been a, a religious veneer amongst people, it wasn't, wasn't much more than an empty ritualism. Yeah, people's religious beliefs made no difference to the way that they lived Monday to Friday. See, actually, Micah's world's not, it's not a million miles away from our own, is it? Okay, they didn't, of course, have the threat of COVID, but they did have their own external threat. Anyone know what the external threat that Judah faced in the 8th century BC? There's a few mumblings. No one wants to commit it. It was the Assyrians. Very good, yes. The Assyrian Empire. Uh, the most powerful, the most brutal empire that had kind of arisen uh, in the world, pretty much, up to that point. And it had little Judah in its sights. Already during Micah's lifetime, the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to Assyria. Uh, and now Assyrian forces were, were, were swarming through the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, Jerusalem itself was under siege. We live in a world where there's lots of fear, don't we? The, the kingdom of Judah, they knew what it is to have fear. So where do you stand on the question of Boris's leadership? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question you don't have to answer, but it's been a, a turbulent few weeks, hasn't it, in, in Downing Street? Um, is it going to be the beginning of the end for him, or is he going to rise from the ashes We'll see. But ancient Judah had its own leadership crisis. Uh, and this last year in my work, I've been working my way through one and, one and two kings, and before that, one and two Samuel. Um, I, I, probably, I'm sure some of you have read through that whole history. It's well worth doing. Because um, the Israelite monarchy starts with great promise. King David... Yeah, King David, the man after God's own heart, 
the God's chosen leader who, who unites all the, the, the Israelite tribes together under his leadership. King David, who receives that promise uh, of, of a great dynasty that, that one of his descendants is always going to be on the throne of Israel. And think of those, some of those royal psalms we, we read in the book of Psalms written around that time of where, where the king is like put on this, this pedestal, this ideal ruler uh, who establishes justice and righteousness and represents God to the people. I'm sure you've read those kind of psalms. That's where it starts with such hope, such promise. But then the cracks start appearing, don't they, pretty quickly. So King Solomon gets seduced by wealth and foreign women and foreign false gods. And the slow decline begins as as king after king after king. They they turn their backs on the God of Israel. They allow worship of other gods to to get mixed in, uh, kind of opening the door to all kinds of evils in their society. It's a depressing story, actually. Uh, And by the time we get to Micah's day, about 300 years later, about 300 years after David, um, there's deep disillusionment with the leadership. With that ancient hope of a glorious king, a king who would surpass King David, who, who would put things right in Judah and beyond, would that ancient hope, would that deep longing ever be fulfilled? Longing for someone to put things right. And it's into that context that we hear God speak in Micah chapter 5, our main reading this morning. Let me read it to you again. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and he will be our peace." I'm sure there's probably a few of you here who um, remember Godfrey Taylor. He was the, the vicar of St. John's Boscombe for, for many years, which was where I kind of grew up through the church and attended for many, many years. We all have our different catchphrases, don't we? I'm, I'm sure I've got mine. Um, but God, at least the catchphrase that I remember Godfrey uh, always saying was this, someone's coming, someone's coming. Someone's coming. Did he say that? Yeah, I'm not making it up. (laughs) Yeah, every he would say, you know, the message of the Old Testament is someone's coming, someone's coming, someone's coming. It's stuck in my mind ever, ever since. And that's exactly the message of uh, the, the passage from Micah this morning. Someone's coming. Not just anybody, but a king, a special king, who, who within later developing Jewish tradition became known as the Messiah, the, which just simply means the anointed one. So what does this passage tell us about this coming king, this coming Messiah? What kind of, what kind of picture does it, does it build up of the one who's coming? Well, I've picked out seven things, so let's look at those very quickly. Firstly, he's associated with Bethlehem. Yeah, today is Bethlehem's actually probably one of the most famous towns in the world. Everyone's heard of Bethlehem, haven't they? It attracts millions of tourists every year. But back in Micah's day, it was a, a little insignificant town that hardly anyone had heard of. A few miles from Jerusalem. So why is it mentioned here? Well, back then, it only had one thing going for it. What was the one thing that Bethlehem was famous for? Yeah, it was the place where where King David had been born centuries earlier. So it was the place where the Israelite monarchy began. 
So this coming ruler, the Messiah, he was going to be in the royal line, yeah, which could be traced all the way back to David. So there's a, a continuity with the law, royal lineage. But there's also a discontinuity. Because, you know, where are Jewish kings expected to be born? It's palaces, yeah, probably in the capital city, Jerusalem, yeah? Um, but it seems that this particular king is going to come from the margins, from relative obscurity, uh, away from, from the corrupt centers of power. Micah seems to say he, he's going to be a different kind of king from, from that long line of failed kings who had come before. God was going to use what seems small and weak in the world's eyes to accomplish his purposes. And then fourthly, the, the birth of this king will be the signal that God is intervening and is going to do something totally new, changing the fortunes radically of the people of Israel. So verse 3 says, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. So Micah seems to be saying, it's going to get worse before it gets better. What lies in store in the near future for the people is exile. Yeah, God's going to hand the people of Israel over to their enemies because of their persistent rebellion over many, many, many years. But the good news, Micah says, it's only temporary. It's only temporary. And the birth of the promised king will be the signal, the signal that the people of Israel will be freed from their enemies, that God is bringing them back from Israel, from, from exile, from spiritual exile and physical exile. The tide will turn when she who is in labor gives birth. And at that point, God's people will come together again, united around the Messiah King. So what kind of leader is he going to be? Is he going to be some kind of, I, I don't know, is he going to be in it, in it for his own gain? Is he uh, going to be simply accumulating power for his own ends? Maybe he's going to be some kind of tyrant. Well, no, the metaphor used of the coming king is that of a shepherd. It's another link back to David, isn't it? What was J David's job before he came, became king? A shepherd, yeah. And then God set him as a shepherd over the people of Israel uh, to be king. So this great count coming king will lead his people with gentleness. They'll be secure and safe under his leadership. Think of um, Psalm 23. Yeah, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes, well, you know it. That's the kind of leader that the coming Messiah is going to be. And is this of only re of relevance to Israel? Well, no, it says his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. The, the rule of, of this Messiah will have global reach. Yeah, people all around the world will recognize the greatness of this king. It's quite a claim, isn't it, for a, a tiny little country in the Middle East on the brink of collapse. Can you imagine what Micah would have said um, if you told him that 2,700 years later, uh, a bunch of people living two and a half thousand miles away would be sitting here listening to his words about the coming king? Quite amazing, isn't it? Probably would have blown his mind. Or do you think he'd play it really cool and say, well, I told you so. <laughs> I don't know. We could ask him. And then finally, the coming ruler will be the one who brings peace. Now, I'm sure you all remember the Hebrew word for peace. Shalom. Ah, well done. Shalom, yes. And you remember that shalom is so much more than just the absence of conflict, um, so much more even than just a, a kind of inner tranquility. Shalom is, is all about mending whatever's broken and fragmented whether the, the brokenness is within me or between me and you or between us and them 
or between communities or between whole nations or between humanity and, and the planet and most certainly between us and God at every level it's talking about. Biblical shalom is about wholeness and well-being and flourishing in every area of life. Don't we long for that? And Micah says that this kind of shalom that the world longs for, it's not found in a philosophy. It's not found in a, a, a political ideology or a political program. It's found in a person. A person. Because shalom will be affected, will be realized, accomplished by this majestic shepherd ruler who, who, who's going to be born in this insignificant town of Bethlehem. Don't you love the Old Testament? Don't you love the Hebrew prophets? I think they're great. I think they're great. There's such richness, such depth, and we've only looked at three and a half verses. I'm going to stop there. Don't worry. So, look, where do we go from here? You may have noticed that I, do, I, I haven't used the J word up to now, have I? And that's deliberate because I think we often jump to Jesus prematurely. We forget that Jesus himself isn't, isn't mentioned by name until, what's that, about at least three quarters of the way through this book. Yeah, God's Old Testament people spent centuries living in this story that I've just kind of laid out, uh, praying and, and weeping over the scriptures, longing, longing for God to fulfill his ancient promises, wondering for, for over 700 years after, the, after Micah gave this message who, who, who this promised king was going to be waiting to see how the story would end. It wasn't obvious. They didn't know. And I think that, you know, during this time of Advent, it's good for us also to, to, to spend time in this story uh, and not always, not always immediately rush ahead. And remember that all of this book, all of this book is God's gift to us. Because I do think that the meaning of Christmas and, and the wonder and the awesomeness of Christmas is much richer when we experience it as the culmination of centuries of waiting and longing, as the culmination of the poignant story of Israel, which itself, of course, is part of that bigger story of God and the world. Because the claim of the New Testament writers, of course, is that these words of the prophet Micah find their fulfillment in Jesus of Nazareth. For each of the gospel writers, whether it's Matthew, uh, Mark, or, or Luke, and John, their fundamental purpose is to show how Jesus kind of fits the, the identikit uh, picture of the coming king, uh, how he fits the, the template, as it were, of the Messiah which Micah and Isaiah and, and all the prophets, and in fact the whole Old Testament from, from Genesis to, to Malachi, uh, anticipate and look forward to. Remember, remember that refrain, someone's coming, someone's coming, which runs all the way through the Old Testament. Well, the New Testament writers want to show that that, that refrain finds its fulfillment in Jesus. So, look, I haven't possibly got time to show all the ways that these seven different parts of the picture, picture find their fulfillment in Jesus. Uh, I'm not going to go on that long. But, each, you know, really, each of them deserves a talk of their own, don't they? They're such big themes. I came across this um, graphic recently. Um, each line down at the bottom represents one chapter of the Bible. So it, it goes all the way from Genesis to to Revelation, and all the lines in between are, are kind of all the, the connections between different parts of the Bible, um, that are kind of cross-references between different chapters. Uh, you know how um, a Wikipedia page is full of hyperlinks, yeah? I'm sure you do. Um, I'm sure you do. 
I'm sure you all know what hyperlinks are. Well, the, the Bible is probably the first kind of hyperlinked book to, to exist. It's certainly more hyperlinked than any other book. You can spend your whole life exploring the hyperlinks in the Bible. Um, but I hope that as I was going through uh, the, those seven parts of the picture, that in your mind, you, your new imaginations, you were starting to make connections with what you already know about the New Testament. That's what we should be doing when we're reading the Old Testament and the New Testament, the whole Bible. Let me just throw out a few. Have you ever thought about the significance of Jesus being born in Bethlehem? Yeah, not, not just because it happens to be mentioned in some ancient prophecy in, in the book of Micah, but because it links him to David and to all the special promises that God made to King David about one of his descendants. Then in Christmas, talk, Christmas talks, we often mention how, how um, Jesus wasn't born in a palace uh, in Jerusalem, but born in a stable in, in Bethlehem. Actually, he probably wasn't born in a stable, but that's one for another time. But then Jesus went on to spend most of his life up in Nazareth, an even more obscure town. Um, and then he went on to do most of his ministry up in, up in Galilee, up in, the, up in the north, well away from Jerusalem, away from the center of power, of religious and, and political power. So although Jesus had all the right royal credentials as a descendant of, of David, he kind of came from the margins. He was a very different kind of king. And then, of course, all the gospel writers, as we said, make it very clear that the birth of Jesus is the event on which the whole fortunes of Israel are hinged, and with it, the whole of human history. That's the message of the angel who, who appears to Mary announcing the birth of Jesus. Well, not the birth, but the that she's going to have a baby. It's the message of the angels uh, announcing the birth of Jesus to, to the shepherds, isn't it? It's the message of Simeon and um, Anna, who, you remember, they hold baby Jesus in their arms in, in the temple courts. It's the message that this is the moment. This is the moment where it's all been leading and that the world is about to be turned upside down because of this baby. We haven't got time to think about in all the ways that the world has changed as a result of Jesus having been born and lived. But we should never underestimate how Jesus and the Christianity that emerged from it have totally revolutionized our world. And then what about that shepherd king? Well we all immediately think of what Jesus says of himself. I am the good shepherd, doesn't he say? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. John chapter 10. That's the kind of king that Jesus is. Isn't that the kind of leader that you'd like to have in charge? Isn't that the kind of ruler you could submit to? Isn't that the, the kind of king that you could trust? One who has my ultimate best interest at heart, who's, who has put himself in the place of, of danger and even death so that I can experience fullness of life. Which leads us back to Shalom. Do you remember uh, the words of the angels who appear to the shepherds. Um, they sing, don't they? Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Yeah, peace. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. And you remember what we said what, shal what shalom was about mending whatever is broken and fragmented. It's about wholeness and well-being and flourishing in every area of our lives. And thanks to Jesus, the Messiah King, the process of mending and reconciliation has begun. Romans 5 says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. So for all those who will place themselves under Jesus' leadership, under his rule, 
there's forgiveness, there's acceptance, there's welcome, there's a clean slate. It's possible to know peace with God. What does Jesus say to his followers? Peace I leave with you. Shalom I leave with you. My shalom I give you. But it doesn't stop there because Jesus is also in in the business of bringing about peace between a fractured humanity. Paul says in Ephesians, for the Messiah is our peace who has made He himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new human out of the two, thus making peace. God's purpose is to create a a a united human family, a family that transcends all boundaries, whether boundaries of ethnicity or, or race, of language, uh, of, of politics, whether right wing or left wing, whether, I don't know, COVID fearful or, or COVID skeptic. All that diversity, all that difference united in our allegiance to Jesus the Messiah. And as followers of Messiah Jesus, that's what we're called to be part of. That's what we're called to be engaged in. We're called to be part of that process of bringing about shalom now, however imperfectly. And in fact, in all kinds of ways, we can and should begin to experience the mending of brokenness in our lives, in our society, and in the wider world. We're nearly done. But we said at the beginning, didn't we, that we continue to groan, even now. We continue to long for the world to be put right. Because although Micah's powerful words all find their, fulfill, all find their fulfillment in Jesus, we have to recognize that much of that fulfillment still lies ahead. That vision of shalom, the the vision of wholeness and well-being and flourishing in every area of life under the rule of that shepherd king, it will only find its final, ultimate fulfillment when Jesus returns, when, when the Messiah King returns to rule the earth and to restore the created order to what it should be. I want to leave you with these words from Revelation 21, uh, which kind of gives us a picture of that time, that coming time. Uh, So just listen to these words. Drink in these words as I read them to you. Then Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Yeah, C is just all the chaotic forces working against... It's like the anti-shalom, the C. So I saw the holy city, the, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. The full glory of the Messiah's reign is yet to be revealed. And so we live, don't we, in this time of waiting and longing, in this time of the the tension between what's already begun to be fulfilled since Jesus' first coming and through the era of the church, and what still lies ahead when he returns in glory. Like for the people of Micah's day, The present 
often remains a time of suffering and it may even get worse before it gets better but the Bible is adamant we mustn't lose hope we mustn't lose hope because Jesus has come and Jesus will return to finally put all things right and so we join with God's people through the ages saying come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus come let's pray Oh, Lord Jesus, we, we long for you. We long for you to come and mend our world, mend our relationships, mend our very selves, mend our broken bodies, our broken minds. We long for you to bring that rich shalom to us and to our world. And we thank you that that day is coming, that your words are true and trustworthy, that it's not an idle hope, but that it is a certainty of what will happen. And so we cling on to that in our struggles, in our fear, in our suffering. We cling on to that hope. And uh, please help us to cling on to you, to wait to long for you. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In your name we pray. Amen. Julian. Um, we're going to sing again now uh, in response to that, and it's God, I look to you. Please stand.
Please sit down. Um, Pauline and Tony. Yeah, go to the scenic group, please. Thank you. Um, they're now coming to lead us in our prayers. beginning of the service we all sang O come all you faithful joyful and triumphant so let's come now to our God in prayer in this way we thank you Lord for the prophecies the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people who waited for the Messiah we thank you Lord Jesus that you are Emmanuel, God with us, in both the high and low times of our lives. Thank you, Father God, for the gift of your Son, Jesus, for your great love, demonstrated by his birth, life, death, and resurrection. Heavenly Father, we pray for our country at this time, where there's so much confusion and spiritual darkness, that there may be a turning to you in a spirit of repentance for ways we've fallen short of your standards, and ask for your mercy on our land. Dear God, because you made the world and intended it to be a good place, and called its people to be your children, because when themes, things seem to be at their worst, you came in Christ to bring out the best in us. So gracious God, we gladly say, your, your goodness, goodness is stronger, stronger than, than evil. evil. Your, your love is stronger than hate. Your, your light is stronger than darkness. And, and your, your truth is stronger than, than lies. Dear God, at Christmas, we remember your extraordinary humility and grace in coming to earth as a baby and as our saviour, Jesus. Please draw close to persecuted children around the world who suffer because they or their families follow you. May they know your peace, joy, and tender loving care this Christmas. Let us pause to remember any families we know of who are going through such persecution at this time. We thank you, Lord, for the special place that Bethlehem has in the Bible. And we pray for the churches at this time in Bethlehem, that you will strengthen and inspire them by your Holy Spirit, also that you will help Christians in that place where economic hardship is often an issue and evangelism can be hard. We pray for our NHS and social care services at this time, that they may not be overwhelmed. Please strengthen and protect stressed and tired staff. We ask that your people working in these services may know your special grace at this time. Let us pause and bring before God all those we know who need your special touch of healing 
and comfort, whether in mind, body, or spirit. Thank you, Lord, for all the answers to prayer we've seen, even in this past week. Thank you for all who came to the outdoor carols yesterday and that you gave us dry weather. We pray for your blessing and the inspiration of your Holy Spirit in the rest of our Christmas services and that any who do not know you yet may find faith. Heaven waited, the angels waited, Mary waited, Joseph waited, the shepherds waited, and the Magi waited for your first coming, Lord Jesus. In our waiting time, help us now to live in such a way that we will look forward to your second coming to bring righteousness and justice to the earth. Let us now join in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, for the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and, and the glory are yours, now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Thank you, Tony and Pauline. Um, just time for some church family news. Um, Tony gave thanks for the carol service uh, last evening, and if some of you were there, you'll know it was a lovely event. And in fact, we were so happy that I think, Bev, you counted about 150, roughly, were there. And the great thing was the majority were people that we didn't know, that were all neighbours and friends, not church family. So that was a really wonderful outreach event. Um, so thank you to everyone who took part in that, uh, the worship group as well, who were there, and it was really wonderful. Um, this afternoon we've got our crafts and Chris Dingle. Um, if anyone is helping on the teams, uh, we've got a meeting at three o'clock, so if you could be here for three. Um, also we've got now, um, there's some at the back of church and in the link, our Christmas cards going out to the neighbourhood. Um, a lot have been delivered already, so thank you for those who have been delivering. There are a few more roads to cover, so if you are interested or able to help, if you go through to the link to the servery there at the back, um, you'll see there's some of the cards and a checklist. If you could just tick off any roads that you're able to help with, please, that would be wonderful. There are some spare ones as well by the link door, so if you want to take any for your own use or for your own neighbours then please do. Um, there's no refreshments this morning um, and there won't be any this evening as well because of um, current restrictions. Um, please also check your pigeonholes, a lot of Christmas cards are coming in for everyone so please have a look at those before you go. Um, newsletters, if you haven't got one, there are a few printed copies at the back and in the link as well. Um, that will cover all the Christmas services. Um, Christmas Eve, another Chris Dingle at 4.30, but remember to book a place if you want to come to that one. Midnight communion will start on Christmas Eve at 11.15 in the evening, and there'll be a Christmas Day service at 10.30. Um, so, time for our final song, which is the carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand.
you'd like to sit down. So we're coming to the end of our service now, but um, please remember to make any donation to the ongoing work of the church as you leave. There are plates at either door, or of course, well, um, if you want to make a, a donation online. As I said, there are copies of the newsletter available as well. So a prayer and final blessing. Father, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us as Emmanuel, God with us, in real tangible ways this Christmas. May we learn to dwell in your presence and seek your face always. And the blessing. May God the Father keep us in all our days. May God the Son shield us in all our ways. May God the Spirit bring us healing and peace. May God the Trinity drive all darkness from us and pour upon us blessing and light. Amen. Amen.